Hi there everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ollie and I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK. And in today's video guys, I'm gonna tell you about the most important patient that I've met during medical school. I've got two things that I need to quickly talk about before this video starts. The first is that we still have a few of the bespoke leather notebook covers left that I designed in collaboration with Will Hodges. There's a link to those in the description below. Please go and grab one. A perfect graduation, birthday, celebration, gift, whatever you like, but we've got a few left. Go grab one if you want one. And secondly, you guys have made it really clear and I'm, I'm really pleased to find that most of you want educational content. Things like the x-ray video have been doing very well, so I will be doing a series on ECGs, CT heads, MRI scans, the things that you'll need to interpret as medical students. All of that is coming. However, I do plan to build a dedicated filming set when I move up north, and I've got and I've got quite specific ideas for the format that I'd like these videos to take. So they're not going to be coming just yet. I want to wait until I'm in my new filming environment to do that series. So in the meanwhile, just for the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing a series called Med School Life or Your Med School Life, something very very similar where I'm going to kind of cover, reflect on the core things that you will experience when you come to med school in the UK. So that's things like what is a ward round? What are medical school exams like? How are preclinical years different from clinical years? Anatomy, histopathology labs, all of these core experiences try and summarize them for you to give either very early years medical students or those of you that are thinking about coming to medical school more of an idea about the actual sort of things that you will experience. I'm really not one for vlogging while on placement or in hospital. I think it's a bit of an irresponsible practice and not really appropriate 99% of the time. So I've been trying to think about how to capture this in a more above board uh, format, but something that will still be genuinely useful while not putting any patients or patient information at risk. But on with today's video, which is going to be an interesting topic and I'm afraid a bit rambly as, as all videos on this channel become, but I'm going to tell you. So today I said, so today I said I was going to tell you about the most important patient that I've met during medical school. Now, obviously, having just said everything that I've just said, this is going to be completely anonymized and it's less about the particular patient than what I learned from the experience and the things that will, inf it's something that I'm really gonna ask you guys to listen to and engage with. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments as we go because it's quite a deep topic, but one that is very, very impactful and it covers a lot of my own personal uh, learning with this subject and it's really important and certainly not something that I realized is as important as it is. So let's just jump in. So essentially just in the interest of keeping this, I could say as anonymous as possible because it's not really about the particular patient or their demographics or whatever. In a healthcare setting, that again doesn't need to be named, I met a person of faith. They were very, very devout and their religion meant enormous amounts to them. Obviously, most people, if they are religious, it means a lot to them. This was a very religious person. And the extent to which they held their beliefs was impacting their medical treatment, or at least the degree to which they were willing to engage with particular treatments. And the long and short of it is that this person was suffering from cancer, and essentially didn't want to engage with the treatment for this cancer that was very much going to be life-limiting and would result in them dying many, many, many years earlier than they otherwise might have with chemotherapy and with treatment. That's the preface to all of this, right? And now, very quickly, I'm just going to take you through my experiences with dealing with religious people, and I've changed a lot in my views on religion and how I interact with people who are very religious. In and of myself, I'm what I would describe as an agnostic atheist, as many, many people in, in England and the UK are. That is to say, I'm a non-believer, I don't believe in any sort of um, higher entity or, or power or, or God or whatever you like. I would never claim to know for definite that there isn't one or multiple, but I feel that I've not been presented with sufficient evidence to warrant believing in one of these higher powers or entities. And that's my position. And I'm pretty chilled out 99% of the time, but I wasn't always like that, particularly in my, uh, in my mid and late teens. I was quite an ardent um, militant atheist, which 
again, around that time, a lot of people are, when you're convinced that you're the only one who knows anything about anything, and everyone else is stupid, especially these people who believe in cosmic beings and all the rest of it. That was the view that I held at the time. Then throughout my later teens, and particularly when I went to university, I mellowed right out, essentially. Um, but I remained extremely interested because clearly it's a very important set of beliefs that massively influences the way that people live their lives and has consequences for their lives. But I just didn't understand it. I had no frame of reference as a non-believer myself. So I helped to found the um, Atheist and Secular Humanist Society at Newcastle University, where I was at the time, where the goal was, was not to promote secularism or anything like that, but it was to provide a vantage point from which to have conversations with religious people and uh, religious organisations about the things they believed, why they believed them. So it was never antagonistic and it genuinely never was. It was a, uh, a platform and a space, a safe space if you like, in which to have debates and conversations and just try and learn more about each other and where we came from and morally speaking how we how do we differ with each other in different belief systems whether that's islam christianity sikhism anything you like even groups like satanism we had we had a group of satanists come in and speak once who were very interesting to speak to and just kind of getting an idea with all these different groups of how are we the same how are we different morally where does that place us all with each other? How can we work together to achieve common things? And it was a really, really good experience and very productive as well. Then I left university, obviously. I came to medical school down here at Warwick. And I'd never really considered, other than the obvious examples like Jehovah's Witnesses and things that are often used as case studies for how people's religious beliefs do or don't affect the healthcare that they receive, I'd not thought more broadly, essentially, about faith and how, how important that might be to patients. And I remember asking in a case-based learning CBL group once, essentially something along the lines of, obviously people's religious doctrines and, and faiths are really important to them and form a central part of their lives, and any treatment that we provide to them should be compatible with those beliefs and should seek to promote them um, retaining their beliefs and being able to practice within the confines of those beliefs as much as possible. But I remember asking, where does the line come between what is essentially a secular health service, the NHS obviously doesn't promote or doesn't seek to promote any individual um, religious doctrines, which I realise is very much a can of worms in and of itself, but it's a secular organisation just trying to get its job done, and I was just always wondering where is the line between providing good quality healthcare and and trying to facilitate people's beliefs kind of where where do you have to put your foot down and say look you can believe what you like but the treatment that you need is ultimately this and how clear or forceful or, or not should a doctor or a healthcare professional be about those kind of discussions and i still for my sins as it were always erred on the side of the treatment is what matters above all else. If you have a health condition and you need treatment for it, the role of the doctor or the healthcare professional ultimately has to be to aim to provide that treatment. And I think that was a little bit myopic, a little bit short-sighted, because then I met this patient and I didn't know them for very long, but I was exposed to this patient and it immediately became clear that because of how devout this person was about their particular set of beliefs, they ultimately believed that the disease, the condition that they were experiencing was essentially a punishment for some act that they had committed or some sin according to their belief system that they had been part of, even though they didn't know what it was. But because it was such a life-changing, life-limiting condition, they were convinced that it had to come from their God. And not only that, but because it had come from their god that trying to engage with treatment or having any painkillers or anything that would reduce the suffering they were experiencing would be tantamount to trying to interfere with the workings of their god and as such they were not taking any medication or any palliation or anything 
that would numb the pain and suffering that they were experiencing. And having followed up some time later on what happened with that case, the, the patient did die um, several weeks later, and may have lived for some considerable time had they engaged with treatment, or again, I should say, had their beliefs allowed them to be able to engage with treatment, or had they felt able to engage with treatment because I realise even now as I'm speaking that using terms like non-engagement or being unwilling to engage, that kind of, it kind of places an unfair burden I think on the patient in this case because obviously if those actions are incompatible with their core principles and values then it's not simply a case of being unwilling to engage, it's they fundamentally can't, right, even if they wanted to, and that's very different. And essentially this experience has just completely changed my view as someone who is going to be a healthcare professional very soon of how to have these conversations with people about their faith and quite how seriously people often take their faith. Because you have to understand that as someone who is not of faith, like myself, there are very, very few things that I hold convictions so deeply about, if that makes sense. Of course there are some sort of universal moralities that we that we all generally hold to, you don't steal, you don't kill, all the rest of it. But there is this whole other layered set of beliefs, obviously, that very large groups of the population have that I do not understand and probably won't ever be able to understand, unless one day I were to find a faith myself and become religious, then maybe I would. Ultimately, all I'm trying to get across with this story, because that's more or less at the end, is that this has been an incredibly fundamental um, consciousness-altering experience for me, that especially anyone who is like I was, one of those angry, ardent, militant atheists, especially if you're young, if you're the type of person that just argues with people online for no other reason than arguing about it, and does not appreciate quite how impactful these beliefs are for people, you're not going to get anywhere arguing with people about things like this, especially if you want to work in a healthcare role. Your job is to find a treatment that works within the belief set of the person you're dealing with. And I think you can be very honest and, and even speak to these people and say, look, I don't understand what you're going through. As a non-believer or as someone of a different faith, I maybe can't, but I appreciate it is extremely important to you. And the ultimate goal of this consultation relationship is we're gonna find something that works for you. Ultimately, we may not find something that works for you, and again, we'll deal with that when the time comes. But now, perhaps quite late on in, in my own journey towards becoming a health professional, and, and maybe just in time, it's something that I do now take extremely, extremely seriously. And I think we all have a duty to do that when we're interacting with patients of faith, and especially those that hold beliefs that are different to our own. And that's where I'm going to stop this story because I've essentially just rambled at you for 15 minutes. But thanks for listening, guys. It's been a really interesting experience for me spending some more time reflecting on this. And I'd really like to know your thoughts in the comments down below. Have you had experiences like this? Are you a person of faith who's dealt with healthcare professionals that have been very good at understanding you or maybe don't understand you but have tried to make an effort or, very sadly, perhaps haven't understood you at all? because I think there's some really good dialogue that we can have with each other here, and that's what it needs to be about. So take care, and I will see you very soon. Thanks, guys.